Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you're all very welcome. Uh, my name is Rory Quinn. I'm the chairperson of the Institute, and we're honoured to have um, Mairead the Guinness here with us this afternoon. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, in the event of an emergency, you go out the way you came in, not through the window, but up the stairs. Uh, secondly, can I ask you to turn off all your um, little phones, or turn them on silent if you uh, can't do that. Thank you very much indeed. Mairead McGuinness has been in the European Parliament for three mandates. Prior to that, she was a very vigorous um, journalist, specialist in agriculture, coming from that background and displaying her skills in many different fora. I can remember with John Bowman many years ago when you crossed paths and so on. We are particularly honoured that you've given time to us to actually come and speak to this very large audience here this afternoon. So without further ado, you have Thank the you. floor. Thank you very much. Um, I was reminded of the country and western song, we're going out the same way we came in, as you gave the instructions. And I'm also tempted to say that, why did I say yes to this? Because I must have forgotten there was a campaign on, and this is Dublin, not Midlands Northwest. But on the other hand, <laughs> on the other hand um, it's an opportunity to listen to what you have to say and maybe just to put forward some thoughts about the future and what I'm picking up when I'm out and about. So it is a great honour to be here. Um, it's great to see a full house. I hope none of you have any hard questions, um, but we don't have all the answers. And I often think that in politics, um, we, we pretend we do. And one of the, the crimes is to say that we have all of the solutions. And I think that's why there might be this, you're either for or against something. I'm a little bit more nuanced. And the older I get, I was going, I'm not sure that I'm wiser, but I certainly know that life is more complicated um, when you're in a position of power and responsibility than when you're just knocking at the door of it. Uh, so I come to all of this conversation from that perspective. And I suppose I, it's important when I start um, the few words I have to say that Brexit has shaped an awful lot of things, if you like, opinions, attitudes and mood. Um, some of us did predict that the referendum would go the way it did, and we're now living with the consequences of it almost three years after the vote was cast. Um, we know that uh, our elections are just a month away, and there is a huge focus on the European Union generally because of Brexit. Um, and therefore, I think there is more focus on the European Parliament. And indeed, the Parliament has been more visible because of Brexit, because, um, and I may well repeat this line, uh, Michel Barnier and uh, President Juncker have been very good at informing the Parliament on every single step of the process. They've been totally open and very transparent. So a lot of the public would have viewed debates on Brexit from the European Parliament. And I think that's been very helpful. I mean, the Parliament has been in focus, of course, from the, the extreme right, because it's the YouTube channel for a lot of MEPs and a very nice backdrop it provides. Uh, so I'm quite pleased, in a way, that at least during the Brexit uh, debates, we've been able to have um, a much more thorough look through at the issues, not just around Brexit, but on the future of Europe itself. Uh, when I stood for election in 2004, we were talking then about the Lisbon Treaty and the fact that the Parliament had more power, and some people forgot to put the word responsibility with that, because I think with power comes extra responsibility. Uh, and some of us take that seriously, and others just took the power part without taking the rest of it. Uh, I'd quite forgotten that the Parliament has been directly elected for 40 years, so it's not in its infancy. It's not a toddler, it's kind of an awkward teenager stage and it doesn't know whether it's going to go right or left or centre or whatever. So, um, and this is the ninth election uh, that we face. I would have watched them, of course, in the past. When you're in them, there is a different, um, if you like, uh, face to elections and to campaigns. The role of the parliament has changed over time and I've been very... Um, Delighted that Jim Nicholson, a long-standing MEP, who's now, as you know, not standing again, and indeed he didn't think anyone would be standing again in Northern Ireland, but Jim's experience in the Parliament, uh, where it was very much just a collective, a debating chamber, really didn't have power compared to what the Parliament can and does today. So it has evolved over time, as the European Union has evolved over time, and that is down particularly now to the Lisbon Treaty, and the Parliament is now a co-legislator. We're on equal footing with the Council, which causes tensions, uh, but that may be uh, an important part of uh, the process of Europe and its uh, future. Um, we're also responsible and um, on the budget, which is crucial. We don't 
tax, of course, but we do have to uh, okay the budget. And indeed, on international agreements, we also have to ratify, as indeed we will be ratifying the Brexit withdrawal agreement if things ever evolve in that direction. And perhaps we'll have a debate about that as to what might happen. Um, and I think the Parliament um, you know, has exerted its powers, its extra muscle, its extra teeth, if you like, particularly around the election of the President of the Commission. And I think you know, that is a significant development, which the Council, the leaders weren't too pleased about the last time around, but the Parliament had chosen um, through this Spitzen candidate and process that John claude Juncker would become the President of the Commission, and he did. Um, I suppose all parliaments are talking shops. I think some view the European Parliament as a particularly big talking shop. Um, but in my view, that's what politics is. It's a talking shop. I talk in the lifts, I talk at the coffee bar, and I talk in the, in the parliament. And that's how people you know, debate ideas or learn what's on everyone's mind and then work towards um, uh, progress. But on lots of issues, I mean, for example, on medical devices where there was a scandal and we had to review the regulation, it takes a long time. And sometimes I think the disconnect that we talk about between citizens and the European Union is because we might announce something five years ago and then another three years later, we're announcing it again. And then maybe in another three years, it comes into the member states. So I think it's the time lag between idea, proposal, reform, amendment, and signing off that gives a sense of what are they doing there. But that is just part of the complication that is the European Union, because it is made up of 28 member states and European Parliament and Commission. So it is one of the complexities. I know that I, I did a lot of work on unfair trading practices in the food supply chain. And when that started out, you know, more than a decade ago, there were three of us in the room from diff different political groups, but we figured that if we wanted sustainable food supply chains, we had to root out some of the unfair trading practices. And um, when Commissioner Hogan um, took over, he initiated the legislation and it is now in place and member states have to implement. So it does take time and I think that's part of our difficulty if we have one around communicating what we do. You probably know that no, none of our groups in the parliament have an overall majority, but neither does any country hold the cards. So it is about that collective trying to come to a majority uh, to move issues forward. So compromise and uh, building coalitions are how we advance legislation. Um, primarily in between different groups, but sometimes even in political groups there are differences uh, depending on the member state that colleagues come from. So while we're with the EPP, there are times when the Fine Gael delegation will vote differently, and that is the same with all others. Uh, you know that the EPP at the moment, the European People's Party, is the largest with 216 seats, the Socialists are next with 185, and together we have 403 seats, just about a majority. But we would work with other groups. Sometimes the EC which uh, would contain the former UK Conservatives, um, sometimes with the Liberals, sometimes with the Greens. So it can be a, a mixed, uh, if you like, gathering that would advance particular pieces of legislation. Um, and in terms of um, the issues really determine the outcome of votes, it isn't always just a right, left or centre divide that, that uh, results come out. The committees are where the key work is done, and indeed, if you're an expert in any area, um, the European Parliament is probably the best place to be, because you can, um, if you like, advance issues and ideas that are important to you. You can take on either the chair of committees. We are not a big enough delegation to do that, but I found ways around that recently. Um, small but perfectly formed, big elbows. Um, so, you know, you can advance things. Um, there was one issue that I dealt with from the very start. I recall two gentlemen coming to my office very angry about enlargement, and they were involved in a charity in Romania. And their anger was that the European Union opened its doors and its arms of welcome at a time when children and people with disabilities and older people were languishing in the most horrific institutions. And Europe was actually funding that. So we worked hard to change that. It took a long time for us to get there, but we did it. So I think that for me, the European Parliament um, has been a place where if you are prepared to work with others, and find a path on an issue you are concerned about that you know is important, you can make real progress, uh, despite the cynicism around it being just a talking shop. Um, so in committees, you can get reports, you can advance debates, um, and you know the system works. I mean, I often think, and I think Gay Mitchell used to say, there's sort of a miracle about how the European Parliament works. There's like a, this um, gathering in committees of reports, ideas, amendments, and eventually it all filters up towards the main parliament where we vote finally on pieces of legislation or resolutions on issues that we think are important. 
Sometimes the differences between groups are very visible and sometimes they're not. It really does depend on the issue. Although increasingly, um, when I chair debates and votes, um, and you're, you're looking out on this vast chamber, there is the, the, the irony to some extent that the hard right and hard left vote the same way practically on all issues. So they're against it for different reasons. It's probably like the Brexit phenomenon. If you look at the, the rejection of the withdrawal agreement, it's because of uh, leavers and remainers are rejecting it for different reasons, obviously. So that trend has, I, I think it's more obvious now in terms of the divide and divisions in the parliament. And there's a fraying of the edges on the center right and the center left, uh, which I will talk about when we look to the future. Uh, of the Parliament, which if you all had a crystal ball, you probably would be better able to judge that future in terms of numbers than I will, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, unfortunately, uh, European elections are still seen as secondary elections, you know, so people either mightn't vote because turnout can be low in some member states, or they might take risks that they wouldn't take in national elections. Um, and maybe that's just a sign of the um, state of play, the, the T time, if you like, line that the Parliament has been in existence. Um, I don't think they are secondary elections. I think they're very significant. And maybe there will be a Brexit impact where people understand the importance of not just the European Union, but also the role of the European Parliament. And indeed, the fact that many MEPs were in Parliament talking about issues of concern to us as a member state, which I think was a really positive development and one that we need to see a little bit more of. Um, as you know, sometimes voters uh, look at national issues, I dare say water meters and medical cards, and these are very real and fundamental issues, which is why 2014 was, they were the dominant issues in the election, because people care deeply about issues that impact them immediately in their daily lives. Um, and I think we, we can't forget all about that. I suppose the one thing that's also true, um, and I made reference to it earlier, is that when it comes to the Parliament, um, it is a wonderful place to make a one-minute speech, which is about a little bit like 10 seconds longer than you need for social media. So those who are very eloquent, and you know, particularly on the, the hard right side of the House, you know, have the capacity to reach out beyond the plenary and beyond Parliament using social media. And some have been around for 20 years doing that. So they have succeeded in the UK in terms of framing the debate that Europe is the enemy and when we remove ourselves from the shackles of it, all will be good again and balance will be restored. Um, and I suppose it's a cruel irony that Europe is so open and transparent and fair that this is funded by the European Union which is a strange thing that you fund something that's about to kill you. Um, but anyway, we can discuss that as well. Um, and somebody did say to me, would there have been Brexit if there wasn't a European Parliament? But then that's really not the question. We have Brexit and we have the Parliament. The Parliament has done a lot of work um, over the last five years, um, and I won't list out the, the number of things it has achieved, but they are there and they're on the record. I think people really focus on what it hasn't done or what they dislike about it. So issues like copyright reform was very controversial um, and a lot of different debate and still a, a debate uh, on that particular issue. Um, Going back to the Brexit process and reflecting on the fact that the Parliament has been deeply involved in it, uh, for me there is a lesson, um, many lessons, but one lesson is that there was a great sense of collegiality when you had colleagues from other member states coming to our country, to the invisible border, and standing up in the chamber the next week talking about our issue. And if there was one thing I'd like to see us do more in the Parliament, and if I'm re-elected I will push this within political groups, we need to understand the issues that affect us in all member states. So that we're not just there. I mean, the green jersey is lovely. I just haven't got it on today. But in a sense, we need to be a bit bigger than that so that we understand the problems in Estonia or what's happening politically in Italy and that we might have a view on that like we've had in terms of colleagues uh, on Brexit in particular. I think that's been very good and I think it's broadened uh, the, the remit of the Parliament uh, and the fact, that, as I said, that we've had these open debates with Michel Barnier and Juncker and Donald Tusk, who I have to say, li I like his tweets because I know exactly what he means when he, he writes them. Um, and I like his uh, statements in Parliament and it was interesting recently where he was really saying to the Parliament and some of the leaders around the Brexit debate, you know, pull back a little, give the UK more time, don't force this, you know, that he has a more longer view uh, than others of us who perhaps were looking to the elections, he has more time for a vision. 
I think there's a problem between national parliaments and the European Parliament because one of my jobs as First Vice President is dialogue with the national parliaments. And we do it. We have a structured dialogue with European Affairs Committees and we meet regularly in COSAC formation and colleagues come from the Allaire. Um, but what I sense increasingly is uh, an unhelpful rivalry between national parliaments and the European Parliament. Some national parliaments want to take back control, it's the new buzzword, um, and are fighting for that, so wanting to make sure they pull more back from the European level uh, to the national level. I also think that many national parliaments and governments uh, across Europe you know, say that they value Europe and the institutions. I'm not so sure that they all value the European Parliament as an institution, or indeed respect the fact that it is the only democratically elected chamber representing European citizens. So I do think we need in the next parliament, whoever is there, to work for a better relationship. Because as I say to colleagues in national parliaments, you are directly elected, we are directly elected, we are all in the business of politics, looking after, we hope, the best interests of those who have elected us, so we should try and achieve it in a collective way, rather than, than having this rivalry, which certainly does exist at the moment. Um, and it also, you know, the old narrative that even at, amongst government or at council level, that uh, when agreements are made on various pieces of legislation and it doesn't go down well back home, then it's nice to have others to blame for that, even though you might have signed on the dotted line as a leader of government or indeed as a minister. Uh, and I think national parliaments could do more in terms of scrutinising proposals. They do it already, but I think we could do more of it. I suppose when I say all of this, and even with my own agenda and time, I think what politicians don't have is enough time to reflect, to read, to talk to each other in places where you're not being recorded, or so that you can have time to thrash out ideas. I, I feel very strongly about that, that increasingly you have to make up your mind before you read it, or you're asked to comment on something. Um, and it's the one thing that I think we all need if we're involved in policy or in any area of leadership, in business or others, is just to let your head settle on issues and try and find more information and think it through and talk to people who have different ideas. That's not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of strength. But I think increasingly in our politics, you're either for it or you're against it. If you're in the middle, you're weak. And in fact, I think those who are in the centre are actually the strongest and the backbone of, of all democracies. I think the council needs to be more open and transparent, and indeed the EU ombudsman, Emily O'Reilly, has made that point. Just a few words on the um, election itself and the issues. Um, you probably know we will have elections in 28 member states. I think that's quite certain now, so the UK will be there. So migration and security, terrorism, climate, artificial intelligence, uh, you know, all of these big ticket items are for discussion. Um, and have to be faced in the, you know, probably the medium to longer term. Our own internal parliament research service have um, come up with 10 issues uh, to watch uh, post the elections and challenges for the European Union. Um, the, the composition, as we're discussing, of the parliament and indeed the commission. I think that will be really interesting. It's also a very exciting time when commissioners are nominated. Um, you know, what will the UK, or rather, what will the European Union be like post-Brexit if we ever get to post-Brexit? Uh, and I think that's something that is a concern because you cannot have this rolling uncertainty. It is bad for everybody. And it's interesting when I'm out and about talking to people um, just in view of the, the campaign that's on, there are a number of people saying to me, just finish this now that the UK need to go, which I, I'm surprised to hear that, but I think it reflects a feeling that, you know, we're nearly worse living with this, we don't know where we're going. And a lot of businesses are, you know, fearful of investing, and, and there is a, a real concern around that. Um, so we also have to talk about the U future of the EU budget, and that will be difficult with the UK remaining in, even if it is for a short space of time. I'm glad to say that one of our own, Tom Arnold, has done Trojan work on the task force for Africa. And to me, that is really a key issue. For my children and theirs, perhaps not as big for me because it's a, going to be a long-term strategy, but we, if we ignore that, we ignore it at all our peril because the future of Europe will only be strengthened by a stronger, developing, uh, good governance in, in our near neighbour, which is uh, the African content. We're looking at trade wars, and, and you will know all about that. Um, and, you know, I didn't know much about intelligence, perhaps, but I certainly have learned a lot about artificial intelligence, and it's quite, you know, exciting. It's also quite frightening. Uh, and I'm, I'm concerned, too, that regulators and politicians are always behind <coughs> the technology. How are we going to ever get ahead of it? so that we do the right thing rather than do catch-up legislation, and I don't have the answer to that at all. 
we have a group, um, SPAS, who look at the challenges you know, beyond 2030. Um, and one of their stark findings is that the world is becoming less free. So democracies are in decline, which is quite a frightening reality. And I might mention posters in that vein, because there's been a lot of talk about election posters. And you know, I have a wonderful husband who puts them up and takes them down, and long that he may continue to do it. It's a big chore, but it's also a part of you know, stimulating debate. Um, even though I do understand that some areas don't want to see posting. But we do need to have a conversation about that. It isn't fair to new candidates. They need to be visible. Um, and it also, I think, if democracy is a little inconvenient, then so be it. I think that a little inconvenience is no bad thing where we have the freedom to vote. And uh, we should just be mindful of that. Global power is shifting. Four of the world's largest eight economies are European, and that includes the United Kingdom. Uh, by 2050, only one, Germany, will remain in that uh, category. Uh, the economy, the world economy, is turning east. Um, in 20 2005, the size of the European economy, if you look at current market prices, was more than six times larger than China. And today, China has all but caught up. So there has been quite significant changes. Tell them I'm busy. I'm not taking calls today. Um, and connectivity, and I mentioned the social media and all that goes with it, um, is also changing the narrative, whatever that is, including how democracies work, how families interact. If it's the WhatsApp. Um, God, I mean, what, without the WhatsApp, where would we be? People used to dial. Do you remember that and sit in the hallway when you were very young and you'd bring the lead under the door because you were talking to somebody you shouldn't be? They were great days, actually. I enjoyed them uh, really well. Um, but I think there's one um, quote from their report which is important. Um, it says, not only does Europe need Europe, but the world needs Europe as well, as an inspiration for a better future, a sound balance between economic, social, and environmental objectives, a beacon of democracy, diversity, and freedom, and a true champion of multilateral solutions and collaborative approaches in a world increasingly dominated by nationalism and zero-sum politics. Uh, and I think that kind of sums up where we're all uh, wondering how the future will pan out. Interesting, when we look at what the European Council of Foreign Relations came up with on what Europeans really want, um, they debunked five myths. So they said 2019 will not be a referendum on migration, because a lot of the debate has been that it will be uh, a referendum on migration. Um, but a lot of people have not decided how they're going to vote, which is why I'm wondering why I'm in Dublin, but we'll come to that this afternoon. Um, and that no single issue is on voters' minds. Um, many are more worried about emigration than immigration. So there are still countries who are losing their, their youngest, their best and their brightest um, to Ireland, actually, and that gets mentioned in, in the conversation. Um, so you know, sometimes what we hear in the headline isn't quite the reality on the ground. There are other issues, for example, Islamic radicalization, 22% of uh, voters are concerned about that, and the rise of nationalism. And just on that whole religious dialogue, one of the other jobs they gave me was dialogue with religious and non-confessional organizations. I think it's really important. I think that for a lot of us, we don't, um, I think, take on board the links between um, religion and politics, and also that people of faith also vote. We're, we're, we've divided. There is a bit of a, a division here, whereas around the world, and if you look at the horrors of Sri Lanka, we know that many religions, and Christians indeed, are uh, persecuted. And it's something I think we need to keep a mind to um, when we look uh, from where we sit. Uh, we don't quite see these big picture issues which are happening around us. Interesting research from the US, Pew Research, on the whole European project. They do it every five years. And in, in essence, Europeans credit the European Union with promoting peace and prosperity and democracy, but say Brussels is out of touch with its citizens. So we're back to square one. So 74% across the 10 countries that they surveyed you know, value Europe because of peace, and 64% for democratic values, but 62%, again, believe Europe doesn't understand what its citizens need. But then, you know, all citizens don't think the same way. So the idea that we would follow a group of citizens and deliver everything is, is just not so. We need to get people to vote, uh, so whatever you can do, try that, because unfortunately the voting uh, level is in decline. 
from 62% in 1979 to 42.5% last time around. I'm annoyed to say that the turnout of women is lower in European Parliament elections in contrast to national elections, which I'm not sure why. It may be back to that idea that it's a second level election and it's not so important. As you know, Ireland seems to love Europe with all its heart at the moment. 91% support Europe were there with the Netherlands. I think that's interesting because the Netherlands and ourselves have done a lot of talking around Brexit, so we get the whole single market customs union thing, and therefore there is a very clear reason why we value that. Um, in terms of Ireland, uh, the issues for Ireland and Irish people, first is the economy and growth. That's the big issue that is raised. Then human rights, and then um, questions around migration. So I think Irish people and citizens have you know, latched on to the damage that could be caused um, with either Brexit or further uh, disintegration of the European Union. Uh, we need to mention that there is concern that these elections will suffer from interference uh, from forces outside, and the Parliament has done a lot of work on that, um, as indeed have others. Um, so it is something to watch out for. And again, Donald Tusk mentioned the external anti-European forces uh, seeking either openly or secretly to influence the democratic choice of Europeans. So it is an issue that we probably will watch. So coming to the results and impact of the election, I'm not going to call it in Ireland because I can't, um, because the debate is only starting. I think the narrative now is that the populace are going to gain and it's going to be a disaster and nothing ever will happen again. And I think if you feed that beast, that will happen. So we need to cut some of this back to a size here and see what is actually happening on the ground. Is it simply um, that it's about disintegration or further integration in terms of the future of Europe? Are they the only options on the table? Um, and again, going back to what Brexit has uh, unleashed is a questioning in all member states about would we really want to leave? So Le Pen has pulled back from Frexit. Uh, countries that are, mightn't be happy with Europe are certainly not saying we want to leave it. They are saying different things about how they might want to see it reformed. Um, and I think that also those of us who um, you know, are in the centre and value trying to make progress with others, I think we're pushing back on this narrative. So we're not just accepting that it is inevitable that there will be um, populist forces who will gather together in great numbers and um, you know, stop the parliament doing its work. Um, because I'm not sure that that will be the outcome. What we don't know, I suppose there's two uncertainties here. One is if the UK remain in for longer than we had predicted. That will be interesting if Labour has a strong number of MEPs that will help the socialist grouping in the Parliament. We also need to look at what Macron will get in terms of numbers and there are people rallying to him and his relationship with Alde. So in a way while we're saying with the EPP might be uh, lower in numbers, it depends on the socialists whether the UK are in or out. That will be a key factor and for how long um, and then how uh, Macron can build his group. So maybe the Alde group will have that kind of balance of power, but it doesn't always work that way. I mean, you, the numbers and how you amend legislation, it isn't simply that they get all their own way because we need them to get the votes over the line, but it will be a more, I suppose it'd be a more intriguing uh, look to the parliament. It's also important to say that um, the far right tend to uh, coalesce for a day or two and then they find reasons to fall out. Uh, so they're not always a very cohesive force. Um, they may be in terms of making speeches, but in terms of collective action, they have more difficulty doing that than perhaps those of us who are more placid and like to get along with people. So I think that's interesting as well to, to reflect on. Um, so if you look at the projections that Politico has made, and these are for discussion, um, about 470 pro-European uh, versus 250 euro skeptics, that's excluding the United Kingdom. So. You know, the figures are, in my view, in the right direction, but there is a strong Eurosceptic um, wing. And it's not to say that those who are Eurosceptic don't have good ideas or ha shouldn't have a voice. Of course they should. I think we would like to see them channel that in a way that is constructive to change how Europe is in a positive direction. The outcome of the elections will also impact on the selection of the President of the Commission. So I think while the elections are important and we'll be all watching the count, um, I only like the result. I hate the middle bit. I hate watching a match. I just want the result. Because if you've been through the torture of training, it's enough. Um, but in a way, I, I believe the one to watch is when the leaders sit around the table on the Tuesday after and they look at who's going to get what. 
and I hope she's in the mix, not just he. Uh, I think that will be an issue, gender, this time around, both in commission and in terms of the, you know, the, the leader positions, because it's been too long in the same uh, gender. Uh, so I think that will be an issue for the Parliament, uh, and it is one to watch. Um, as for the candidates for Commission President, my own colleague Manfred Weber is there for the EPP and is mounting a very strong campaign, Franz Timmermans for the Socialists and the ECR have Jan Zahidral. So they're there and they're out there working. It's interesting that the ALDE, the Liberal group, which Fianna Fáil sit with, haven't one nominee but they have a team of seven called Team Europe. So there's a lot of kind of power play to go on. I will have in my speech, and you can look at uh, all the graphs and charts uh, that are you know, interesting from a country by country perspective. Um, just a few other comments generally then on the parliament. Um, I'm a great believer in you deal with the hand that you get. So whatever happens, whether there is a stronger um, Eurosceptic voice, um, we will, I think, still be able to do things. But I don't think it's such a bad thing not to do everything because sometimes you're better as Commissioner Juncker did talk about too that less can be more and it may be a time when Europe should reflect on where we're at now if we need legislation and it's urgent we should do that but where it's not urgent we should look at how we're implementing and what's happening on the ground because very often uh, the Parliament legislates we sign off we clap ourselves on the back and we don't follow through on some of the consequences both good and bad of the legislation that we have put through the House. So I would like to see um, the European Parliament being a place where European issues from all member states were debated and that I would discuss issues of concern to colleagues in other member states and they would come to me to know what's going on because I think that's a truly European Parliament rather than us all going out and looking after, uh, just talking our own story. And I think there's a lesson for us um, as a small member state in terms of the solidarity around um, Brexit, because I've been asked so many times, you know, will they let us down in the end? And I, it's quite curious how insecure we are. And I wonder, I'm going to phrase this carefully, is it because we mightn't be so loyal sometimes ourselves that we doubt others' loyalty? Because I think that is part of the thing we're afraid. Um, but I do think that solidarity is a two-way street. So I think we do need, as Irish people, to understand more and be concerned about issues for other member states uh, in the way that they have been concerned uh, for us. And we had um, the last leader speech to the parliament in Strasbourg was the new prime minister of um, Latvia, uh, Mr. Karen, who's a former MEP and he's now prime minister. And he, he spoke to us in the EPP group because he's part of our political family. And he said around the council, everybody looks towards Taoiseach Leo Varadkar. And if Leo says it's OK or it's not OK, they follow him. So in other words, that they do coalesce around a colleague that has a difficult issue. Uh, and I hope that that is continued. Now, I don't dismiss that there will be many issues where it will be difficult for Ireland. We'll have to bat our corner. And I think that's part and parcel of politics. Um, but coming into politics rather later, perhaps, than some, and maybe being also um, full of impatience and, and a little bit critical of Europe in the past, um, I, I, I see enormous value in it today for the very fact that I'm there and I can give the voice I can talk for Ireland and I'm listened to. We're not a huge country, we haven't many MEPs, but if you use your voice effectively and coherently, you do get a good hearing. And if you're a worker and work well with other colleagues and support them in their challenges, you can make progress for issues that are of concern to us. So my last and final words on the makeup of the Parliament. I hope there aren't too many Eurosceptics. It's likely that uh, some form of the Brexit party and, and UKIP will return. I, I actually think that uh, Nigel Farage secretly wants to be in the European Parliament because he's had such a good time there. Um, and I suppose if that is the case, we need to mark him a little better than we did the last time. If there is one regret I have, is that we were doing all the, you know, tidying and fixing that directive and we're signing off on that regulation. And meanwhile, the game was being played on the right and the noise and the shouting. We should have got on with our job as good, you know, citizens and good politicians. That was a mistake. We should have been much more politically engaged in fighting back the narrative. 
that has for the last 20 years led, unfortunately, in the United Kingdom to, uh, which I'm very sad about, a divided parliament, which is bad for parliaments and democracy, a deeply divided society, which is really, really unhealthy. Uh, so I take some of the responsibility that those of us in the responsible centre should have been watching with the corner of our eyes and, and really fighting back. And in this election, we have to stand tall and challenge those who say that Europe is a disaster and that the, you know, the national countries themselves are better off alone. Um, I think Ireland and my Irishness uh, is very important to me. But I've also become so aware that the issues of Northern Ireland, which we sometimes take on board actually and sometimes we don't, but I, I feel them now because I go through Northern Ireland to represent my constituents in Donegal. And the idea that that would change and suddenly a third country with all of that it would entail is just something that I could not allow happen on my watch. And lastly, because of the week that's in it in terms of the peace process and the assembly, it has saddened me in the European Parliament to hear voices from Sinn Féin and the DUP shout at each other and not talk to each other. And that is a real tragedy. And I hope, uh, because Simon Coveney, the Thonish uh, and Minister for Foreign Affairs, is a man of great patience and strength, I hope his work succeeds in bringing these people to the table because Northern Ireland desperately needs an assembly, desperately needs a place where people can debate and society and all the ills can be worked towards healing. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed. I propose to take three questions at each round, and I'm looking for questions. If you want to make a speech, uh, there's still time to make them elsewhere, but we do want to, in fact, you get as many better. questions answered by this very articulate person. So, who do I see? Yes? Self? Sorry, I should have said, could I ask you to um, identify yourself by name and any organisation that you're a member of? Sure. Uh, Declan Casey. Sorry, Declan Casey, the Irish Funds Industry Association. Uh, the Econ Committee in Parliament is a very important and influential. Uh, the, the Econ Committee is a very important and influential committee in, in, in the European Parliament and, uh, for the setting of financial services legislation. Uh, the country has benefited from uh, Brian Hayes' representation on this committee to date. I wonder if you have any thoughts or suggestions how we might ensure Irish representation on this committee in the next parliament. Thank you very much. Next question here. Okay, my name is... Uh... commented on this morning in the Guardian and one of the points I'm making about that is that we may actually have underestimated how well uh, the UK um, argued the backstop that actually what we've been thinking all along is the backstop was something they were agreed by but actually they could benefit by um, by way of dumping maybe as a, as a sort of a backdoor to dumping um, products that would not be acceptable to have within the European Union I wonder if you could comment on that. Okay, we have a small technical problem at the moment, which will be fixed, I'm sure, but I'm just restating the three questions. The Econ Committee, um, where Brian Hayes has in fact played a, a marvellous role in my particular view, 
uh, the whole position of Macron and what his impact is on, on the Parliament. And finally, the last uh, question by Paula Rose, which you might just restate. Is it? Sorry? You might just restate what your, the essence of your question is. What, just on the backstop and, and just on... On the backstop and, and yeah, related matters. Yeah, okay, okay, I'm just trying to include the people who are at the back who can't possibly hear. Okay, so the first question from Declan Casey. Um, uh, cloning is not allowed in Europe, otherwise we would have cloned Brian Hayes. Um, but I think you're right. He's, t he's, he's tough, he's energetic, and he worked really hard, and he's also great fun. So we will miss all of those things. Um, he has spoken to me about the Econ Committee. He thinks I should go there. And I think we do need strong representation. And to some extent, while we, you know, all the MEPs we elect come from different political uh, groupings, we should try and be on different committees so at least we're aware. And Econ is certainly one that we should be on. So I, I think there will be some members elected who will want to be on Econ. So I don't think there will be a vacuum. Uh, and I think a vacuum would be terrible just for ourselves here. Secondly, on our attitude to Macron, I mean, he's, pr he's pro-European. So I, I think that... Yeah, but I mean, you know, you don't, these things don't happen overnight. So my, uh, my view of Macron, if you take the existing structure of EPP, S&D, while we probably don't want him to do well because it takes from us, on the other hand, he will not be voting against a pro-European agenda. So at the moment and during elections, people will pick holes. But when it comes to the hard talk and the hard play of getting a legislation through or in debates, his voice will be part of that pro-European, maybe not in the same uh, speed or direction totally, but it's not going to be an anti-European agenda. He has difficult issues at home, uh, which he's trying to, to work towards as well. So I don't see that as an issue. Um, we just have to see the numbers that he would get. Paula, that's really a psychologist question, if ever there was one, and I think you might be able to answer it more than I. Um, look, the big problem for uh, Europe is defending the Irish issue and the peace process, keeping the border invisible, and protecting the single market and standards and regulations. Because if there is the slightest gap in the invisible wall, ways will be found to breach it. You know, so that's why um, Barnier and others have said repeatedly, we have to be conscious of both of those things, which is why one wonders from a psychologist's point of view, why did Theresa May draw her big red chalky lines or you know, indelible ink lines at a party conference about how she would proceed with Brexit. Because that was the difficulty. The referendum outcome was one thing, but it was the, if you like, saying we're absolutely leaving this, that and the other. That's where she became politically trapped. And therefore, when somebody mentioned, but what about Northern Ireland? It, it was like, oh, oh. And what's interesting is her proposal to solve the Northern Ireland question uh, was accepted finally by the leaders, but not accepted in the House of Commons. Um, and I, I remember making an observation on, on a British television programme way back that I, I wonder what's happening, and this is a, beyond your question, um, in British society or in their psyche, because for a great nation, they are, ex in my view, demonstrating great vulnerability, that they feel weakened by being part of something big and strengthened if they pull away. And they do believe they're going to do much better trade deals than they might within. Um, and I think that's just interesting. If I had time to write about it or study it, I would. But I don't think it's quite as Machiavellian as you think in terms of um, that they want this because it will allow them to breach walls. One of the areas I am concerned about is in the political declaration, there is reference to the European Chemicals Agency wanting to stay close and the European Medicines Agency. But there is no reference to the European Food Safety agency. And if you recall, the reason why that whole structure was set up was because of BSE, which originated, indeed, you, Pamela, you can talk more about this than I, in the um, United Kingdom, but it's not referenced. And that troubles me a little around the regulatory issues. Okay, three more questions, please. One at the very back, please. Steve. Yes, sir, stand up. Uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, really uh, enjoyed the presentation yourself and our responsibilities in Europe on the television of the past while. I, uh, very quick, I'll just read it through as I can. I had the joy of, of studying the person who headed up Weber and Weber in uh, the, the lobby group who headed them up in Brussels. And one day he said to me, um, This is the town of Azar in Spain, and the, the Polish Premier, the, the, the twin brother of the fellow who's there now. And he said, These guys are, are missing in Europe. He said, that Europe works towards uh, identifying a common problem and putting yourself forward as a part of the solution. And today I see that getting even worse. And your question is? Uh, yeah. uh, the likes of Odron, the likes of, of 
of people who are presenting Brexit. How can we, if you think it's a good thing, how can we help reduce this kind of noise and what towards can a common future? Thank you very much. Next question, do I see? Yes, question here in front. So, uh, Jonathan Lowy, Citadel Securities. Um, my question really is, um, you, know, you were saying that, uh, that I suppose the far right and the British media, I would add, also have done a huge amount to try and destroy the European project and have been lucky enough to work for us a few times. What actually tangible things or what plans can the European institutions do to spread the good word about what Europe is doing for the EU? Thank you very much. Any other questions this round? Yes, sir. Um, Justin McCann, I'm an architect. Uh, François Mitterrand, uh, when, before he left political politics, identified to the, to the European Parliament in his last speech that uh, sort of nationalism c'est la guerre. What would be the, does the European Parliament regard nationalism as something positive or something negative? Okay, um, so how can we help? Um, I think I made the point that we shouldn't accept the narrative that is being put out there. You, you shouldn't accept something as being inevitable. So in other words, that the, there will be more um, hard right elected and they will si stop the parliament um, from doing what it needs to do. You shouldn't accept that at the start of an election campaign. You should fight against it. I think the second way, um, and I'm going to link in terms of uh, the second question, uh, John, if I may, um, about what can the institutions do? Drop the word institutions. Institutions can do nothing. People can do everything. So in other words, even though I'm pulled and dragged everywhere across 13 counties, down to 11 now, I go to schools, primary schools, secondary schools, small business groups, large business groups. I go to individuals because I think in Ireland we have one benefit. We are directly elected. We fight to stay. People challenge us and they meet us. I think the problem for some of my colleagues, they're on a list. So I know people are on top of the list and they know they're coming back. I don't know that. None of us running know that. So I think MEPs need to be more engaged in the constituency. It's difficult when you're away, but it's not impossible. And actually, if, you're, if you believe all the stuff that we will say about the, the power of working together as countries and people, if you're passionate about that, then you have a duty to do it. I mean, I could be at home probably, but I actually, when I see... Actually, when I see the venom sometimes coming out of people in the parliament and what they are suggesting and who they are decrying and put, pitting a person against another, I feel I have a duty to stop that kind of narrative. And you only do that not by institutions, but by people. And everybody has a voice and an ears, and it's a question of not stifling debate. I mean, I'm not saying Europe is, is wonderful. In fact, it never will be. It will always be imperfect. So this is a job of just tweaking all its imperfections. But from my point of view, is it good that Ireland is at the table with 27 others and we're part of the conversation? Yes, absolutely. Um, and is the idea of disintegration something that I would worry about? Absolutely too, because I think that in the world we're facing at the moment, um, you know, working together, whether it's in small or large groups, but certainly at the EU level, is really positive. Where it gets tricky, Compromise is something I promote all the time, and the word solidarity, which when you go into schools, very few children know the word solidarity. Honestly, it's been actually shocking for me. When, and, and when you talk about it then, I say, well, what are you, you know, when you're working together on, on your committees or wherever, they get it, they actually understand it, but they mightn't have understood the word itself. But the problem with compromise is that usually nobody's fully happy. You, so therefore, it's very hard to be chirpy and come out and say, well, that's great, I got my way. Whereas a lot of politics today is about the, you know, the, the maleness of it to some extent, or that kind of thing, I, I won and he lost. Um, but everybody can play a part. Um, and also, don't allow people um, either say Europe is perfect or dismiss it in its entirety. There are great people. The, one th the word that I really dislike is um, bureaucrats. I mean, because my team in my office will be regarded as bureaucrats. They are the hardest working people anywhere. And they are totally committed to doing really, really good work. So we shouldn't just take the words and accept them and use the same words to beat ourselves up on. The attitude then uh, on nationalism, it depends on the shade of it, I think, to some extent. I mean, we're, we all value our citizenship. And 
I don't see myself as being part of uh, a United States of Europe. I don't see that vision, but I see myself as being part of the European Union um, as an Irish person. And I think his nativism is, is probably where there's more worry about. But it, I think we also shouldn't underestimate that when people are feeling insecure, when you're feeling ill or worried, where do you go? You go home. So you retreat back to your home as a human being. That's our natural inclination to those you know best. And when you see that reflected then in politics, uh, where people say, you know, the other, you know, the migration crisis and the takeover and all of these sort of narratives, people then say, well, God, we have to look after our own uh, first. And it's to try and break that um, narrative uh, to say that, of course, countries and um, your own citizenship is so important to us all, but it doesn't exclude us having a bigger vision and a greater view. And that's why when I mentioned the Task Force for Africa and Tom Arnold's work, um, in, to my mind that is one of the most significant pieces of work to come out of the European Union, because if we do not uh, deliver on what's in that report, <coughs> then I'm afraid what we're leaving behind for our children and their children will not be very pretty. And perhaps some of our uncertainties in this developed world is because we know that actually we're exposed. We're exposed because we have it. And there are others who do not. And we also know that the way we consume and produce in terms of climate is not sustainable. So we're the ones that perhaps have to make the greatest change. And change is difficult. Thank you very much. I have time for one more question. Because this lady has a job to do. Yes, um, Ambassador. Okay. Stefan Kosa, French ambassador. I have two questions, in fact. One is on transnational lists. Um, <coughs> President Macron was promoting that, and uh, we were very pleased that uh, uh, the Taoiseach was uh, supporting it. What was the feeling, and what is still the feeling, because we're, we're hoping that it will uh, eventually uh, take place uh, within the European Parliament to that, uh, to that idea? And, and the second question is regarding the campaign in Ireland. Do you feel uh, that truly European issues will be discussed with Irish citizens, or is it going to be about the local road and the local uh, uh, parish being renovated? Okay, thank you, Ambassador, for those two questions. Um, I always listen to the local issues, because if they are the things that are of concern to people, they are the issues, and we should listen to them. Um, but it doesn't uh, take from the fact that in Ireland, because of Brexit, I think European issues are more important. Um, or will be discussed more, but it will be in the context of how is Brexit going and, and all of that. So if we hadn't that issue, we mightn't be as tuned in. This could be just like any other European election, where it is the national and local agenda that would dictate uh, the issues. So um, to some extent, um, it's a little bit of everything. It's the local, it's the national, because if you take even how we campaign, it is my county councillors that will bring my name and, and information to the doors. I can't canvas all of the doors, so they have to listen to the local and then bring it to the European. But they are getting on the doors a keen interest in the European election, so that is positive. In terms of the transnational lists, as you know, the Parliament weren't mad about it really, or at least the, the majorities weren't. I like the idea, but frankly, my language skills are appalling. Um, and because my children, I have four children, they were quite young when I got elected, I had to prioritise just work and, and home, so I did that. But I am determined to improve them, both my Irish and French and the bit of German that I have. But I think in the long term, I think they, ha they will have a place in the long term. If you take what I've been saying around Ireland and Brexit and other colleagues speaking about our issues with, pa with a passion, some of the Spanish colleagues, with a passion that we didn't have ourselves, um, then I think that does reflect um, a real benefit if we have people who can cross those divides. But it's, it's a long way down the road. I don't see it happening in, in the short term. Um, and I think that's okay. I mean, Europe was never done in a hurry. You know, usually big changes happened when there were crises, um, including around food and other issues. So um, I hope that answers your question. I think some of us, I know even my own delegation, not, not everyone supported, the Fine Gael delegation supported them. I kind of like the idea of a bit of risky, you know, just look, look beyond the now. Because if you look back at when Europe was formed, I often wonder would it ever happen again? Because remember, they didn't have iPhones and Twitter and social media. So those politicians could actually sit in a room and smoke cigars probably, I'm sure, and have cognac. Um, but come to a, a good decision that we needed to move beyond the weapons and the wars and the horror and division. Um, and maybe my concern now is that because we have this instant access to information all the time, that nobody's reflecting. 
deeply on where we need to go on all of those big challenges. So uh, maybe you, Ambassador, could tell us what's going to happen in the, <laughs> in the elections. I'm not turning it on you, but uh, you probably have more idea than I do. And indeed, we're going to miss some of our French colleagues who are not running. And that's the other thing. There will be quite a loss of, of political memory. There's going to be a big turnover um, of colleagues who've been in the Parliament for a long, long time, the likes of Elmar Brock, um, uh, there are French colleagues there, there's British colleagues that aren't standing again. So there's a lot of colleagues that will go and we will have a parliament that will, you know, some of will have learning plates or L plates as I had in the beginning. Um, but it takes about six months and you realise it's not that different than the parish council. It's just bigger. <laughs> You've prompted a response from myself in relation to your last few comments. The first common policy ambassador that the European Union of Six had was on food and agriculture. And everybody in that room had direct experience of starving. The worst year for Germany was in 1947-48. Uh, that memory traveled with the first and second generations. I have a feeling, because I'm now in the third generation at one level of remove, that that memory isn't there anymore. And just like the First World War, where people sweep, uh, sleepwalked into a war that nobody thought would happen, we're so far into the realm of prosperity and security and, and the elimination of fascism in so many different countries, particularly in Southern Europe, that we take it for granted. We do so at our peril at our peril. So we wish you well and thank you very much for your time. You're the first speaker who's let out early uh, because you've got a job to do and we wish you well. Thank you, thank very, you very much. much Appreciate it. Thank you.